Uh, hey guys, and welcome to this episode of Metacast. Uh, this week we are here with Terry McGurran, uh, who played Coach Mountain and Squid Guts in Metabots. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, I'm going to roll all the way back to the start of your career for the first question. Uh, okay. and, and just ask in general, uh, do you remember your, your first voice acting gig or I guess your first gig in the sort of show business world and how this all started for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in Canada, there's a, a thing called the Canadian improv games in high schools. It's a high school competition across Canada. Um, and I started, I started in improv and continued through, you know, into my thirties and forties, even doing improv. But, uh, but yeah, my first voice gig, I still would have been living in Ottawa. I, uh, I moved to Toronto in 93 to go to school. Um, but yeah, I was still living in Ottawa and I did a, a voice on for better or for worse. The comic strip turned into a cartoon. Are you not familiar with that comic strip? No, for better. <laughs> it was it's it was a very family oriented like it was all about oh what a crazy family and i played like the son's best friend so i think i was in two episodes or something but that was my very first time doing voice acting yeah um and then i guess we we sort of fast forward along uh and metabots comes around um i guess how did those roles sort of come about to you um i think they brought me in to audition for uh, Coach Mountain, which I was a little surprised by because I'm I'm uh, I'm not a big guy, uh, so to you know to get into that kind of basement voice that they wanted for Coach Mountain, I, I thought no, I'm not going to get this. Uh, and then they brought me back and kept auditioning me for additional roles, um, which often happens in uh, dubbing uh, because the uh, the money for dubbing a show isn't as good as when you create a show. So uh, they try and get actors who are playing tertiary parts to kind of double up or triple up, which I think I ended up doing three roles. I can't remember though. Uh, Mountain Squid Guts. Hmm. I think one random wiki did list uh, Dr. Armand as well. Uh, <laughs> but okay, the wikis have been all over the place when I've done research before. So I... Uh... <laughs> yes, IMDb is the same. I, I often see myself listed for something that I did not do on IMDb. And I'm like, some poor bastard is looking at this on IMDb going, who the hell is he? That was my voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with those those two roles with Coach Mountain and Squid Guts, uh, one of them being a lot more heroic and one of them being uh, a villain, do you have a preference when you're doing voice acting to which of those kind of roles you play? Well, I mean, definitely in Metabots, uh, Squid Guts w was the stupid one who got to say like a lot of really funny lines. So yeah, I, I had my preference definitely lean towards skid Squid Guts. Um, and also like, I mean, as a stand-up comedian, it was fun to, they kind of let you improvise a little bit in the booth. So I would have fun more so with Squid Guts. I would get away with doing stuff like that. Uh, Coach Mountain was a pretty serious fella. <laughs> a bit more uh, to the script exactly as written. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of room to play. I mean, I really, I was just shouting at Tenryo and making people run laps. You know, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good little role. Um, yeah, yeah, not bad. Uh, and then I guess in your, your roles since Metabots, um, do you think you have sort of a, a niche or a role that you keep getting called back for that you you keep doing well or a stereotype or something like that uh there's definitely been a the needle has moved um for a long time uh i was like um you know teenage boy with a chip on his shoulder was my niche like i just i was getting called for every kid it didn't matter if he was in a schoolyard or in space or whatever it was if he had a false bravado and a marshmallow inside, as the character description would often read, uh, it was my part. Um, but uh, but lately, I've been auditioning for a lot a lot of dad roles um, on like you know uh, friendly preschool type shows, which has been a, a bit of a change for sure. Yeah. 
Um, I guess, does the way you approach a role uh, change much between, as you say, maybe a, a chip on a shoulder teenage boy versus a dad role, or are you just going into it with the exact same mentality? Um, I don't, I, and I don't know that there's a, if this is a truth for a lot of voice actors, but I, I find the way I stand, the stance I take in front of the microphone or the, um, the body language will often help me find that character. Uh, I don't know why, but like for Scaredy Squirrel, uh, I, I, I didn't bend any of my joints. Like I was like a stick figure in the booth for Scaredy Squirrel. And I don't know why, but that really narrowed in that character for me. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll come in with the attitude. I think the the character needs to have obviously, but, uh, finding a, a body language that helps me stay in that voice really works for me. Uh, any chance you remember what crazy body language you had for either your metabots roles? I, to be, to be very honest, it was early enough in my career that I don't know like some, I've gone back and listened to some of it because I was like, oh yeah, I, I used to, I played a character like this before. Like, you know, like I've got an audition for like the big tough guy and I'm like, I should go back and listen to Coach Mountain again. And I listened to it and I kind of go like, oh, geez, oh, that was, that was, I wasn't really locked in at that point. Um, so I don't, I don't recall having body language for either of those two. I don't, no. Um, and did you... Uh, you mentioned they're going back now and watching uh, some older episodes. Did you watch them at the time they came out? I don't believe I did. I was, uh, I didn't have kids myself, so I probably wasn't watching a lot of cartoons. Um, and I, uh, I was doing stand-up comedy. I was on the road all the time. So I would come in for Metabots like when I was in town and I would like record like 10 episodes or something. And then I was out traveling back and forth across Canada or to Europe and stuff to do stand up. Hmm. So how did you find the the balance between doing stand up and uh voiceover? Like it's both, I guess, in front of microphones uh to find a common ground. Yeah. Um I don't know. I mean, it's it, at that time I wasn't really thinking that this was going to be what my career became. I still kind of thought, you know, like I was still going to LA and I, I got all the way to network for mad TV, probably around the time I was doing Metabots around 2000, I was in LA and, uh, I really thought like comedy was going to be it live performing comedy, whether it was on TV or in front of live crowds, I thought that was going to be my career. So, um, yeah, I wasn't really that focused on on voice work at the time yeah and now the worlds have sort of flipped a little bit uh yeah thanks uh, i mean fresh tv when i was doing uh jonesy on 16 uh i i think it was in the first season of that show that i invited uh tom and jen perch who created the show to come and see me do stand-up uh in town i was doing a show in town and they were like yeah okay so they both came out to the show and they were like did you write all of that and i was like yeah and they were like do you want to write an episode of 16 and it was this weird thing that i had never considered and i was kind of like yeah i'll try it you know um and i've been working you know i mean on and off but with fresh since then i'm still i'm story editing a show for them right now so that that's kind of how it came to be it was like and then I had kids and the idea of being on the road, you know, 40 some weeks a year wasn't as appealing. <laughs> Although sometimes it's quite appealing, the idea. <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, yeah, when, when I go to like your IMDb and stuff, there's almost just as many writing credits as there is uh, acting credits on there. Um, do you prefer to be... Uh, I guess, on the writing side of things or uh, voicing or being in a show? Oh, uh, it does. It does flip flop. Like, you know, I mean, there are, there are days where the writing job comes really easy and you feel, you know, uh, 
very thankful to have it. So you're, you're like, yeah, this is, this is the one I like more. And then there are days where you get a really juicy part in something and you go in and, and do it and you leave feeling really great about what you did. So I don't know. I, I really do enjoy them both and hate them both at times, you know, depends on the day yeah. and, uh, it what depends on the day. Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess, is there, has there been a project that you've worked on, um, throughout your career that uh, is that sort of feeling where you just mentioned where it's just flowing and it's just uh, perfect, really fun the whole way through either side of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, on, on 16 probably. And it's still this, it's still this weird, like it'll still happen to me. Like even ne- like I was, I was just up at um, the alert station, which is a Canadian military base at the North pole. And I was there in uh, 2000, I guess it was 18, really just before the pandemic started. It was my last uh, show for the Canadian forces. So I was up there and I was chatting with someone and I'd mentioned like, oh, I did cartoon voice work. And I mentioned 16 and it was this uh, woman who was like, you know, in her thirties. Um, and she said she had grown up watching this show 16 and because of the character, Nikki, she felt able to come out to her parents because she felt like Nikki has somehow become this, um, you know, this character that a lot of, a lot of the gay community looks to as a, she's one of us kind of character. Um, And so you get those moments where people like the show really touched them or helped them in through things and, uh, and to have been a voice on that show and to have written some of those episodes that people reference. And you're kind of like, I did not imagine that 20 years after I was still going to be hearing about this, you know, like that's a, that's a pretty special thing to be part of. Yeah. Um, and then flipping it back to something that uh, might touch people a little less, the robots and the uh, uh, fighting teenagers. Um, yeah. Was there any, I guess, particular moments from the show, maybe lines you recorded or even just memories from being in the booth uh, from your time on Metabots? Um, yeah, like there were, like I said, like it was, it was still fairly new to me at that point. Uh, it might've been my first between that and Pandalian. I think those were kind of my first two, like I'm recording or supposed to be recording on a weekly or bi-weekly or whatever basis. Um, and sometimes I'd come in just dreading it because I didn't feel confident about it at all. And I remember, uh, for quite a while, I was showing up just after Motiki was finishing and Joe Motiki would be walking out of the booth and he was just, I thought he was like 12 years old, but you know, he was an adult, but he would walk out of the booth, just like guns blazing, just like, thanks everybody. What a great day. And like, his energy was always this thing. And it would just make me go like, Oh God. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think the things I remember most about that show were like the, the relationships I formed with Julie Lemure and Joseph Motiki and Darren Frost and uh, Merlan as the director. There was, I made a lot of friendships that I've, I've, I have to this day. Yeah. And I guess with uh, Canada being a fairly small, close knit place, especially for voice acting, you also run into a lot of those same people just in random gigs around the place. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've, I don't know that I've voiced anything with Motiki since, um, but I've worked a, quite a bit with Julie Lemure and, and Darren and I were doing stand up together at the time as well. So, um, yeah, I, you do see a lot of a lot of the similar people. Oh, and uh, Stacy DePass, too, ended up playing Nikki on 16, who turned into a, like my girlfriend on 16. So it was fun to. I, yeah, yeah. Um, and then if we pivot entirely into your, your new stuff, uh, we'd, we'd be remiss to mention the fact that you play Snoopy, uh, on the Snoopy show. Like it's a pretty massive role. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. That was like over two years of auditioning, um, to get that part. And I, every time I thought like I'd leave the booth feeling really good about what I had done, but I also tried to keep my feet on the ground because I'm like, this is so big. There's no way they're not going with an American. Like they're going to go with an American voice actor. Like, um, 
but it, it did come down to me and another actor in New York. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really fun part. And um, I've had a lot of press people reaching out, like asking me for interviews and stuff, which is kind of weird for a voice gig. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a feather in the cap for sure. Definitely, uh, especially with all the interviews and stuff, raising your profile a little bit as well. Uh, yeah. It's it's always a, a fun game. Like, I've talked to people who have done, like, even just Darren, uh, you know, do commercial work and stuff, and you get stopped in the supermarket, and they're like, I recognize you from this commercial. You don't necessarily get that as much with voice acting gigs, you know, unless you're talking to someone and they go, this sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, almost never. Like, I've never had anyone go, I recognize your voice, you know. But then again, I, I play a lot of dogs and squirrels and things like that. So I generally don't talk like a squirrel when I'm out in public. <laughs> Why not? This is the real <laughs> question. You're Why? right. I don't know what I've been thinking. <laughs> just go to a restaurant and just order in Scaredy Squirrel. Just complete character. That's right. That's uh, right. I'll have the acorns. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm sure they'd love it for like the first thirty seconds. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, with the with the Snoopy show and everything, you talk about a really long process uh, to audition. Um, what was the the feeling? You know, when they finally say you've got the role. Um, what was what was happening there? Um, well, I'll, I'll preface it by saying I was I was never a superhero kid. Like growing up as a, a kid, I. I I, I really loved Peanuts like that was like that was one of my favorite cartoons like the Christmas special and all that stuff I loved Snoopy so to even be considered for the part was huge and then to when my agent called I kept, like even the first few records I kept thinking this isn't real this is going to go away at some point or I'm going to wake up and go like oh no it was the guy in New York got it and all of this past month or two has been a dream um yeah it was it, it's uh it, it still surprises me sometimes <laughs> that i'm the voice of snoopy and we just we just started watching it because like i mean we'd seen snoopy in space but uh apple tv just put out the snoopy show and uh my kids and i have watched been watching it together and it's it's still kind of trippy to have your your kids looking at the screen like this and then turning to dad look back at the screen you know it's it's fun <laughs> Yeah. Um, and if we we talk about another one uh, of your projects, really just the the whole total drama universe, really, um, you've been involved with that all over the place again, both sides of the table. Um, how's your experience been with that universe? Um, yeah, that's another one where the the fan base is so active um, that it that it takes you by surprise sometimes. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's obviously a positive thing to have such an active fan base, but, you know, obviously there's, there's some fans that get angry about, especially because it's an elimination show. And if you're invested in this one character in particular, and they get eliminated before you're ready to handle it. Um, we've, I've definitely gotten some very negative emails from fans, um, <laughs> Which, you know, you kind of take in stride and you try not to reply because you're like, oh, this is just going to engage someone that I shouldn't be engaging. And um, so there's there's some of that aspect to it, especially with Total Drama Rama, um, which has been really interesting because the fan base is set like at this tween audience and they've grown with the show. So some of them are in their 20s. And then Cartoon Network was the one that kind of came to us and said, can we create something that is more like the Y7, like that seven to nine year olds? And we were like, well, that's not what Total Drama has been. And they were like, yeah, but we we're, we want to get the younger kids into the tr Total Drama world. So creating that show, uh, there's been a, a fan base that has been very upset with us thinking that somehow it was our decision to just not go back to the island and to turn it into a daycare and um some people just don't really have a sense of how television works 
Uh, so there's been a lot of that, but now we're going back to the island. So hopefully that will make fans happy. I'm sure it won't make them all happy because again, people will get eliminated, but that's the show. Yeah. Uh, Cause, uh, we, I don't believe we've had, uh, the, any of the total drama world stuff in New Zealand that I recall. Um, but I've had a few people now who've had roles in that. So I've researched and, and watched stuff and, um, as you say, definitely a very uh, interesting uh, group of fans. Uh, rabid might be a, a adjective I use. Yeah, um, that's a fair one. Yeah. And when you mentioned uh, before we recorded this, you know, like, oh, we're doing a reboot for Total Drama Island and stuff. And I like, oh, I wonder how they reacted to this. And it's exactly as you say, it's just a mix all over the place of some people really loving it and then some people really hating it. It's just so polarizing. Yeah, we have to, you know, I mean, everyone talks about it at the studio as like, you know, just don't, you don't need to go to the fan page, you know, like, um, but we do get a lot of like wonderful, you know, there's a, there's a guy who sends out paintings of all the characters to the, like the actors that play those characters. And, you know, there's, there's both sides of the coin and there's probably more happy and supportive fans out there. It's just uh, some of the uh, some of the more rabid ones, as you put it. <laughs> I'll blame it on you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all me. Uh, the, yeah, it's always the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know. So. Yeah, I guess the the fact that you're even able to to come and do a reboot of the show should show to everybody that there is a lot of support from the uh, the happy or the good side um, of the fan base as well. So hopefully yeah. it all uh goes well i would again i can't not ask what what can you what can you tell us i know it's not a lot but what can you tell us what can i tell you um oh wow that's a that's a tough one because we're so early i haven't even signed a non-disclosure yet that means so everything can you can tell us everything <laughs> <laughs> um i can tell you right now that we're uh we're developing uh our characters right now and it's uh yeah it's it's going to be uh all new characters and they're really fun and it's 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 gonna have it's gonna have the feeling of season one and hopefully we can up the anarchy a little bit yeah uh and if people want to to reach out or get a hold or have a chat with you uh purely only from the good side of the fan base no rabid fans allowed um do you have social media links or places where people can check out what you're doing or even see new Total Drama Island information when, when you're allowed to say it? Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't delve into that stuff so much. I mean, uh, Christian Potenza definitely posts more of the Total Drama stuff on the uh, Facebook fan page. So uh, he's, he's more involved with the fan base than I am. Um, but reaching out to me uh, 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 on Twitter is, is cool. That's, that's where you'd find me. And I'm at, uh, at stand up monkey. Uh, yeah. You know, everything's monkey. All of my, everything, emails, all my social media, it's all monkey. When did you choose that branding? When you were like, I'm going to be a monkey. <laughs> uh, I, I think my first, uh, I shot a, a comedy now special, which is for CTV here in Canada. And I, the full Monty was like a big movie at the time. So I called mine the full monkey and it just kind of stuck every, all the other comedians started calling me monkey and you know, I was pretty animated on stage. So it made sense. It stuck. Have you, can you remember voicing a monkey or is it just other animals? Have you not managed to, to join those two up? Oh my God. I'm sure I've voiced a monkey. I can't remember what show it was on. I I really tried on rocket monkeys. I got pretty far, but I didn't get the part, but yeah, I, I, I must've voiced a monkey on scaredy squirrel or some other animal show somewhere, somewhere. (laughs) Yes. All right. Well, thanks a lot for, for taking time out of your day and having a chat today. Oh, Grady. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Cheers.